Hello, and welcome to Emmanuel Church Rio Rico's online virtual worship for April 21st, 2024. Let's pray. Lord Christ, we welcome you to this time, to this place, to our hearts, and we pray that you would speak to us and teach us that even though many years separate us from your earthly ministry, yet we are not separated from you at all. You are ever present with us. You are ever aware of us and our needs. Lord, we lift up the needs of those around us who are suffering, those who are ill, those who are injured, those who are going through turmoil and difficulty. Lord, those who are going through pain, those, Lord, who are being persecuted for their faith in other countries. Lord, we lift up each person who needs you. We pray that you would use us to reach them. Be with us now. Teach us and change us. This we pray in your precious and holy name, Lord Christ. Amen. Calling today's message, A Matter of the Heart. Uh, Jesus is talking about the hearts of those who are present with him. And let's just take a look at it. We're continuing in chapter 16 of Luke, of course. To begin with, God knows us. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you are the ones who justify themselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For what is considered exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Now, this is the same passage we ended with last week. And yes, I know I'm doing this, but this really is what makes the next passages make sense. You have to realize who Jesus is talking to and why he's talking to them. He has just said, that you cannot well worship God and money at the same time. You cannot have two masters. You can only have one master. But you see the Pharisees who enjoyed their wealth, who enjoyed all the things they had accumulated, they got a great deal of pleasure from their high position. And they were sneering at him. They turned up their nose at him quite literally. But you see, Jesus knew what was in their heart. He said, you're the ones who are justifying yourself in the sight of men. But God knows what your heart is. And the word that he uses here, uh, that's translated here, this is the Lexham translation of the New Testament, by the way, uh, as abomination. It means it's absolutely repellent, abhorrent, horrible to God. God cannot stand, uh, just cannot stand what is going on in their hearts, what they value. Because you see, earthly values are very different than heavenly values. Wealth is very welcome on earth. There's a few places that wealth is not welcome. But money and the things it buys and things in general are not what's important to God, and to value those things over God and over his people is repellent to God. So important to know that because God knows us. He knows what's in our heart. We can act in such a way that people around us might say we're really good, but God knows what's in our heart, and we can't hide it from him. The amazing thing is he still loves us. Next, the kingdom is proclaimed. The law and the prophets were until John. From that time on, the kingdom of God has been proclaimed, and everyone is urgently pressed into it. Now, this is a, an unusual passage, and I particularly use the Lexham translation here because of the way it translates this passage. Jesus is saying that the law and the prophets, which is God's message to his people, was available and it's what people were, were using to know God, to love God, to serve God. And certainly there had been generations of people who were faithful servants, who loved the Lord with all their heart and mind and soul and strength because of what the law and the prophets taught them. But you see, John came and starts proclaiming the kingdom of God in a new way. In fact, John proclaims that the kingdom of God is at hand and points to Jesus 
as the way we become a part of the kingdom of God. Now, many translations use um, translate this word biazzo, uh, which is the root word uh, used here that means to apply force in Greek. They translate it in, uh, in a very active way, saying that people are being forced into the kingdom of God. And yet that stands pretty much opposed to everything else Jesus ever said about the kingdom of God and opposed to anything we have ever seen. I think, and I and so do the translator of the Lexham edition here, that this is being used in a passive way. Uh, it, it's, it's talking about the persuasion applied to everybody through the preaching, the proclamation of the gospel. You see, that's what John was doing. So through this message, everybody is urged to enter in. But not everybody will, because they are not forced to enter in. So they are urgently pressed into the kingdom. They are, they are wooed. They are called. They are, they are told why it's important to be part of the kingdom. And these people, some will enter, but many, perhaps most, will not. Next, God's values. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to become invalid. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and the one who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. I think these two verses, which are sometimes separated, even with chapter headings here, I think that they truly belong together because this is what Jesus is telling. He's illustrating this truth, that, that the, the truth of the law is not invalid. Just because Jesus comes to bring people into the kingdom, he has not obliterated the law. And the illustration here is a man who divorces his wife and marries another committing adultery. And the one who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. There's some things we need to understand to fully understand this passage, though. You see, in the first century, it was not a priest or a rabbi who married a couple. The couple married each other. The woman would go to live with the man, generally in a home that he had prepared, or perhaps in a room that had been added on to his parents' house. And by going and bring her into his home, they became married. To be divorced, all that a man had to do was write out a paper saying, I am divorced from this woman, and they were divorced. It was not like it is now. Today, there has to be some sort of official witness to a marriage. It is a government-sanctioned thing in that there has to be legal paperwork in order to be married. It is indeed a legal action. And to dissolve a marriage is an additionally legal action. But in the first century, it wasn't that way. Women could not divorce men. Only men could divorce women. And what would happen is, by divorcing that woman, she became, I guess you could call her damaged goods in the eyes of the community. She no longer had a husband, a man to care for her. She had left her father's house and now did not have her husband's house. And so she was often kind of helpless. And to do such a thing to a woman was a particularly cruel act. Now, I'm sure there were cases where there were divorces, where the man who divorced the woman made sure that she was provided for. But I'm also just as sure that that was not commonplace. And so divorce, which is a horrible thing, it is soul-rending. Uh, there's a good reason God hates divorce, because it is it is damaging to us. It is hurtful to us. It is a painful 
wrenching experience involving lack of trust, loss of trust actually, involving pain, and sometimes involving a great deal of bitterness. And Jesus says the law didn't go away. God still hates divorce. It's still painful and terrible and something that should not happen. Now, the answer, of course, is to think carefully and well before getting married. Trouble is, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes we don't know things until it's too late. God can forgive divorce. He does. He has. But God can forgive murder. God can forgive theft. God for can forgive rape. God for can forgive horrible sins, terrible things, but it does not make them good. It shows us that God is merciful and loving, not that we deserve forgiveness. And Jesus may be very specifically speaking to some of the Pharisees in the group because he knows their hearts. And he may specifically be speaking to someone there who is plotting to divorce his wife. It may or may not be true. We do not know that. We do not see evidence of it. But I cannot help but think that Jesus is addressing those people he's been addressing all along. And if he's addressing them with specific needs, with specific issues in their life, then that would make this kind of out of place statement make a lot more sense. He's saying the law doesn't go away. Divorce is still wrong. And if you're thinking of throwing your wife out, you are committing adultery. And he's warning them, not out of hatred, but out of love, as he always does. We need to remember that the law points towards Jesus. But once we find Jesus, we don't ignore the truth embodied in the law and the prophets. We learn from it, and yet we follow only Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Christ, we pray that we might be truthful and true to you, that we might love you and that we might follow you. Forgive us for our sins, Lord. Bless us, restore us, and use us. This we pray in your precious name, Lord Christ. Amen. Go in peace, and may God bless you.